on this computer. Morning to our early uh, early joiners here. Appreciate you being prompt for our, our webinar today. Uh, we're gonna let people join for about the next five minutes or so, but we'll try to start right on time at uh, right around 11, 11.01 to let people trickle in. So uh, just sit tight until then. And uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Morning, everyone. If you're just joining us, thank you for uh, making time for us this morning. We're looking to start here in the next two or three minutes as more people trickle in. So uh, please just sit tight and then we'll uh, try to get started right on time about 11, 11.01. Thanks. Morning, everyone who's just joining us. Going to give it about 30 more seconds here to let some people come in since it is 11 on the dots and we do want to get started with our webinar today. So uh, yeah, please just sit tight and then I'll give a little short little intro and we'll get going with the webinar. Okay, well, it's about 11 o'clock, so let's get this started. So welcome everyone. My name is Matt Noble and I'm a communication specialist with the Oregon Department of Transportation and welcome this morning to our second web webinar about the federal NEVI, NEVI funding. As you all saw from the invite, this is our update to you guys about uh, what two months or so after our first one. So we have some new information for you today. And uh, once again, we'll be doing about half and half, so half presentation and then half a Q&A session. So uh, yeah, we hope you came today armed with questions because we have answers for you, of course, a presentation first. So if uh, Wayne, you could advance the slides, please. So what to expect today from us. If you haven't done a webinar uh, before, it's pretty simple with Zoom. As you can see, you are muted when you come in here. That's by design. Don't worry, nothing is wrong. You also cannot start your video. Also by design, don't worry, nothing is wrong. And also, like I said before, we have about half and half today, 30 minute presentation, 30 minute Q&A. 
uh, you can check the chat for links. The chat will be used today only for uh, links from us, or if you have a technical issue, you can type in the chat. I can see that as the meeting host and I can help you out and you know, answer more technical Zoom questions there. Um, and of course, we're also recording this webinar in the background. So we will have that recording for you just like we did with the first one. So if you wanna uh, look at it back again or, even, or revisit, share it with someone else, that's totally fine. That'll be up soon. We have everyone who's attending today so we can share that, that all with you uh, later this week. So like I said, today, we're gonna be hearing from several people. We have uh, several wonderful panelists for you today. Uh, Amanda Peets is the ODOT's Administrator for Policy Data and Analysis Division. She'll be followed uh, in her speaking role by, let's see, Jillian Demedio, who is uh, one of our Senior Transportation Electrification Analysts here at ODOT. After her, we have Jessica Rikers, who is from the Oregon Department of Energy, and she is our Technology and Policy Manager. Following her will be Mary Brazel, who is the other half of our Electrification Dream Team here at ODOT. She's the Program Manager. And finally, uh, Suzanne Carlson, who is the director of the ODOT Climate Office, will close up the presentation. Then you'll see my pretty face again to host the Q&A. Next slide, please, Wayne. So burning through, how to use Zoom. So during the Q&A section uh, or during the presentation, you'll see some buttons down below. The Q&A button is the one you want to use. That's the one if you have a question during the presentation that you'd like the panelists to ask. Just type, just hit that button. You can type your question in the Q&A and that goes to the panelists. Uh, we will have folks in the Q&A uh, section during the presentation answering some easier kind of low level questions for you. But um, safe to say, we will try to get through as many Q&A questions as we can during the actual Q&A section. You can also uh, raise your hand if you wanna ask an audio question. So just type that button or type that button, hit that button during the uh, Q&A uh, portion. I will see that as a host. I will call on you and then I will allow you to unmute yourself Then you can unmute, you can ask your succinct question and then the panelists will answer you and then I will mute you again to kind of put you back down the line so we can, so we can get to the next person. You can do either one you want, you can wait till the end for the audio, you can drop it in the Q&A, either way we will get to you. And any question we don't answer today, I will have a recording of everything so then we will follow up with you uh, either individually or collectively. And also real quick, I do see some folks on the phone today. So thank you for joining us by phone. And if you would like to uh, raise your hand via the phone, you can dial star nine to raise your hand. And then that will flag that for me and I will uh, unmute you so you can ask your question on the phone. And Wayne, I believe that is it for the how-to questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Amanda Peets to get the presentation proper started. Great, thanks Matt. Uh, good morning, everyone. So as Matt said, my name is Amanda Peets. I'm the Administrator for Oregon Department of Transportation. I oversee the Climate Office, Policy Planning, Research, and Data. Uh, pleasure to be here with you today. And really, my role is to talk about the exciting thing, which is um, ODOT, Oregon DOT, is all in on transportation electrification. So uh, we are dedicating over $100 million uh, towards electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Much of that comes from the NEVI funding that you'll hear about today. That's about two thirds of the funding between uh, the allocation that we get and uh, the match that comes along with that. But we are also dedicating some other funding along with that um, to address some other gaps uh, beyond what the NEVI funding can uh, achieve. And so what you'll hear today is uh, much of the funding that we're getting from the federal government is fairly prescribed towards certain uses. Um, and then we're adding some additional funding to that to um, address some of those broader needs that we have um, within communities and in some other areas as well. And really this commitment is part of our overall commitment towards uh, addressing climate change and um, greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. There's a lot of different things that we need to do to address the climate, um, including uh, investing more in biking and walking, uh, public transportation, those zero emission modes. But a big part of it is vehicles and fuels and really making sure that every single mile that's driven is clean. And so this is essential to us getting there. Um, in terms of reaching our goals, we know that we need a boatload more chargers, uh, about five-fold increase just within the next five years. And so we need that significant investment to match where we're trying to go there. And the market's there. We're seeing a lot of car manufacturers putting these things out there. We need to have the infrastructure to back that up. When people start seeing the infrastructure out there, I think it reduces that range anxiety, makes people feel more comfortable that they can charge on their day-to-day -day routes or to their um, recreation destinations. And that's what we wanna enable through this and other funding. So we're really pleased on doing that here today. Next slide. 
So as I mentioned, what we will focus on is what's known as NEVI, that's the National Vehicle Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program. That's funding that we're getting from the federal government. Um, we'll talk about the amounts here in a moment. So we'll go over what is that structure? What are we required to do? Um, and then we'll talk about the plan. We've talked to several hundred people actually throughout this process just within the last few months to really help us shape this and make sure that it's good, that it's gonna work for Oregon, that it's gonna work for EV users, and that we're really thinking about the partnerships, not just the Oregon DOT putting this out there, but our partner you'll hear from today in presentation, the Department of Energy, other state agencies, uh, the private sector certainly, and those public and private partnerships are key to making this a success, along with utilities, EDFPs, and others. So all it's all of us working together, and that's really what this plan helps promote. Um, and talks about what that future will look like. We'll have some time here, as Matt said, hopefully 50-50 uh, for questions and answers. And so to not delay that time for public comment, I'm gonna go ahead and flip it over to Jillian Demedio, who will talk to you next more about the NEVI program. Great, thank you, Amanda. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jillian Demedio. I'm a senior transportation electrification analyst with the Climate Office at ODOT. And I'm gonna kick us off this morning with a brief overview of the NEVI program. Uh, for many of you, this may be a repeat of information, but just please bear with me as we try to quickly get everyone up to speed, and then we'll jump into the meat of our presentation and the details of our state plan. Um, so first, for those who don't know, the NEVI program is a $5 billion program that will provide dedicated funding to states to strategically deploy fast charging infrastructure along our nation's highways. ODOT and Oregon uh, will receive $52 million in federal funds over five years through NEVI, uh, and there is a 20% non-federal match requirement, making this a $65 million uh, program in total. This funding must be spent along our previously designated alternative fuel corridors, and in the first year of the program, we expect to have about $9.6 million, including match, to spend, with uh, $13 million each year thereafter. In addition to the acquisition and installation of EV charging infrastructure, funds under this program can also be used for development phase activities such as planning, feasibility analyses, environmental review, uh, mapping analysis and modeling activities, operating costs and maintenance for the first five years of operation of the equipment, data sharing uh, about EV charging infrastructure and signage as well as other traffic control devices. Next slide, please. So there are a number of federal requirements that all states must meet as they spend their NEVI dollars. And this is really meant to ensure a consistent user experience across the United States. Some of these key requirements include that each site must have a minimum of four high powered uh, fast chargers. So high powered in this case uh, is a minimum of 150 kW. These stations must be located every 50 miles along those federally designated alternative fuel corridors and can be no more than one mile from the corridor. States are required to collaborate with agency partners, with stakeholders and the public as they develop their NEVI strategy. And we're also required to develop a state plan in accordance with federal guidance uh, that must be approved by the federal government uh, before any funds can be obligated and spent. This plan is due to the federal government by August 1st, um, and that is the subject of most of our webinar today. Uh, in addition, all states must follow the federal government's minimum standards and requirements for EV chargers installed under this program, and we'll talk in a moment about what these minimum standards cover. And lastly, the program is subject to the Biden administration's Justice 40 initiative, which means that 40% of all benefits of this program must accrue to federally defined disadvantaged communities. Next slide. So last week, the Federal Highway Administration issued their 180-day guidance in the form of a proposed rulemaking in the Federal Register. Um, this was published to the Federal Register on June 22nd with a 60-day comment period. So comments are due uh, by August 22nd. And this rulemaking basically establishes regulations setting minimum standards and requirements for projects funded under NEVI. Um, including around the installation, operation, maintenance by qualified technicians of the charging infrastructure, interoperability, signage, data collection and reporting, network connectivity, real-time information on location, pricing, availability and accessibility, and other areas such as NEPA, uh, ADA, and civil rights. 
Um, ODOT is in the process right now of reviewing these carefully. Uh, we do intend to submit questions for clarification and comments to the Federal Highway Administration. Um, but of course, it's a, a requirement that we design our program to meet these minimum standards. So we will be meeting them. And in some cases, we do expect to exceed them as well. Next slide. So as mentioned, NEVI funds must be spent on fast chargers along Oregon's alternative fuel corridors. These are highways throughout the state that have been previously nominated by ODOT and approved by the Federal Highway Administration as alternative fuel for electric vehicles. We are well positioned in Oregon. We have seven uh, existing alternative fuel corridors, uh, three that run north-south, I'm sorry, four that run north-south and three that run east-west and pr providing pretty good geographic coverage across the state. Um, so three interstates, I-84, I-82, and I-5, and four U.S. highways, U.S. 101, U.S. 97, U.S. 26, and U.S. 20. In addition, this year we nominated four additional corridors that we believe provide additional urban and rural coverage uh, for us in Oregon. So two additional interstates, I-205 and I-405, both in the Portland metro region, and then US-95 in southeast Oregon and Oregon-42 in the southwest. Um, right now, we believe that the $65 million NEVI program is sufficient to build out all 11 of these corridors if the four proposed this year are approved. Uh, and moving forward, ODOT's going to be taking a phased approach, uh, adding additional corridors over the next several years if we find that we'll have enough funding under NEVI to, to build them out. Next slide. So that is a very brief overview of NEVI overall. The rest of today's webinar, as I mentioned, will focus on the elements of our state plan, which we've been working hard over the last several months and which I'm sure many of you are eager to learn more about. Uh, as mentioned, ODOT is required to submit this state plan to the federal government by August 1st, and it must be approved before we can spend any NEVI dollars. This is a five-year state plan, but there will be a strong emphasis of, on year one of spending, and then we'll update this plan on an annual basis, adding more detail uh, for years two through five. There are, also, there are several requirements of the state plan, many of which are listed here, and we're going to go into a lot more detail on these elements with the rest of our time today. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it along to Jessica Rikers. Thanks, Jillian. Hi, I'm Jessica Rikers. I manage the policy team at the Oregon Department of Energy. Uh, next slide, please. So the vision of the state plan was to create a backbone network of high powered EV charging stations along major corridors, which will significantly increase Oregonians confidence that EV charging will be as ubiquitous and convenient as fueling with gasoline. To do this, uh, we've got a five year goal, five years to spend the money. Uh, and in the first three years, the intention is to fully build out the NEVI compliant EV charging stations on the seven existing alternative fuel corridors that um, Jillian just mentioned. And in the following two years, uh, we are thinking about uh, other possibilities of things that we might wanna do, such as fully building out NEVI compliant EV charging stations on additional EV alternative fuel corridors, those that are being proposed today and potentially in future years. Pursue additional investments as needs arise to increase the EV charging coverage, maybe less than every 50 miles, or adding more chargers at existing sites, um, upgrading other existing stations that are not NEVI compliant to be NEVI compliant. In these last two years, there may be more of a focus on charging needs for freight or intermodal types of transportation and e-mobility hubs. In addition to these goals, the state plan emphasizes charging that is reliable, user-friendly, safe, consistent, affordable, and accessible. And further, there's no, there is significant focus on investments in communities where the choice to buy an EV is hindered by limited EV charger availability, such as rural areas and areas with multi-unit dwellings. This supports state equity goals and will also meet federal justice 40 goals. Next slide, please. ODOT and ODO have a long history of collaborating on EV chargers. We collaborated on the successful Tiger Grants in 2007, which established the West Coast Electric Highway. Uh, click next, please. You can see that along with these green highlighted diamonds here. Um, and we continue our collaboration today as we have been working together in developments of this state plan and other EV related work. In fact, ODO helps facilitate and ODOT leads the Zero Emission Vehicle Interagency Working Group or the ZEBIWIG, which is the state's primary planning and action team for interagency related EV work along with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, Department of Administrative Services and the Public Utility Commission. 
and the Zevi Wiggs work funnels into the Every Mile Counts initiative, also led by ODOT, to plan for and implement cross-agency activities to meet the goals of the statewide transportation strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector, and EV adoption plays a critical role in that strategy. Uh, click one more time. In developing of the state plan, we looked at several types of, quote, existing conditions, and this was directed by the federal government. All of these factors affect the spacing and need for EV charging infrastructure along corridors, including terrain, climate, population density, travel patterns, freight routes, long distance trips, and other factors. These factors also directly inform where we see lower EV adoption levels, which may be partially due to lack of EV charging options and inform needs to bolster equitable access to EV charging. For example, most EVs are registered in areas where there are only single family homes, likely because of easy access to EV charging at home. Similarly, while nearly a third of Oregonians live in rural areas, only about 12% of EV registrations are in these areas. Some of this may be due to the need for more public charging infrastructure to support the longer distances rural Oregonians may need to travel. You can see on this map now, there are about 160 public DC fast charging stations with more than 250 public fast charging ports. So there's multiple ports often on a single station. This does not include Tesla charters, which are proprietary only to those vehicles. As Jillian noted, NEVI funding must be spent first on Oregon's EV alternative fuel corridors. You can see what the DC fast chargers are today on Oregon's EV alt fuel corridors. And only about 10% of today's public stations, about 20% of today's public fast charging ports meet those NEVI standards. That is, have those high, four high powered DC fast chargers within one mile of an exit on an EV alternative fuel corridor. With NEVI funding, Oregon will come close to doubling the number of DC fast charging ports and will increase the number of charging stations by about a third. This will also help Oregon achieve one third of the 2025 transportation electrification infrastructure needs analysis goals that ODOT put together for corridor DC fast charging. And of course there are private company charger investments happening um, apart from NEPI, uh, often by utilities, automakers and other private companies. And now to tell you more about the plan itself, I'm going to pass things over to Mary Brazel. start my video. Good morning. I'm Mary Brazel. I'm the Transportation Electrification Program Manager in the Climate Office at the Oregon Department of Transportation and very happy to be talking to you this morning about our state plan concepts. Uh, on this slide, we talk about the public outreach that we've actually done to date. For this program to be successful, we need to engage with a broad range of stakeholders early and often. It's a five-year program, so we've just begun this process the state plan will be a living document and will evolve over time. So since February's first round of federal guidance, our goal has been to communicate clearly about these investment, addressing the who, what, when, where, why questions. We hosted a webinar on April 4th, announcing our NEVI webpage that asked for your input through surveys and an interactive map, as well as answering questions raised during that webinar. Over 300 people have responded to our surveys, two thirds of whom are EV drivers. And over 28, I think it's now about 40 cities, communities, companies, and organizations have raised their hand to say they're interested in being site hosts for NEVI charging stations. And you've suggested over 450 potential locations for EV charging. So it keeps changing every day as you all uh, go online and update it. In addition, we've hosted dozens of one-on-one -on -one conversations and made special presentations to several groups, such as the League of Oregon Cities and the Emerald Valley EV Drivers Association. We invited five different groups to information sessions to share our thinking and to ask for your input on specific topics, including EV drivers, cities and counties, utilities, EV charging companies, and contractors who install EV charging, as well as EV environmental justice and other advocates. And so now let's move on to the state plan and what we heard from you, first of all. So the first thing we wanna do is say, we heard you. We heard your concerns, whether it be for flexibility and our goal to include 350 kilowatt DC fast chargers at our sites, or how best to encourage charging in cities along corridors and add more, or how to ensure reliability, stable operations over the long-term and that station spacing reflect EV range challenges due to climate or terrain. 
We heard utility concerns about timelines for operation due to supply chain or electrical capacity realities. And we heard equity concerns like affordable pricing and workforce development that need to be truly embraced in this program's implementation. We've moderated some of our initial positions and plan to incorporate several contracting provisions to respond to these concerns. And we're still doing research in other areas. We expect to frequently clearly communicate plans and be flexible as we move forward over the next five years. Next slide. So some of you have seen this slide before. We shared the strategy in previous webinars. And while it's evolved, it's largely remained the same. ODOT will not install, own, operate, or maintain NEVI charging stations. We'll partner with the private sector through public-private partnerships like the West Coast Electric Highway. We plan to seek 20% matching funds from private sector partners. We'll develop requests for proposals for an entity or a set of partner organizations to develop a corridor or a large segment of a corridor. We expect to incentivize both building new and upgrading existing DC fast charging stations. Our contracting provisions will target reliability and incorporate all minimum standards. And as we did this year, our goal will be to add additional EV alt fuel corridors in future years at a measured pace to ensure our funding will support corridors to be fully built out. Next slide. Our contracting strategy reflects this deployment strategy and will incorporate provisions to recognize challenges in initially low utilization areas where we may offer support for operating expenses while balancing this with the Oregon benefits unique to Oregon from our clean fuels program for EV charging infrastructure providers. All federal guidance and requirements will be incorporated into the contracts, but there may be areas where Oregon exceeds federal standards. We'll look for staying power and a proven track record, community engagement, and programs to encourage reliance on local, diverse workforce and apprenticeship programs when we're looking at EVSPs to contract with. Our process is noted on the bottom of the slide. Each year, we'll analyze and confirm planned corridor developments, conduct regional workshops with communities along corridors in advance of annual RFPs, and work with our partners to fully to further engage with communities and deliver true Justice 40 benefits that can be measured. Next slide. So this will take a minute for us to go through. This is where are we going to invest? Our investment plan is phased to reflect five guiding principles, geographic balance, charging access for disadvantaged and underserved communities, inclusion of high traffic corridors in the earlier years, leveraging the private sector's existing and planned EV charging infrastructure investments, and emphasizing connectivity with neighboring states to establish a true interstate EV charging network. Our goal is to build out entire corridors at a time and to build out the original seven EV all fuel corridors in the first three years. This will allow opportunities to build out additional corridors that we propose during years four and five, or add redundancy or focus on freight or evacuation routes, depending on our needs and guidance from the federal government. Our, as we phase corridors, we also considered costs, and we want to include a mix of rural and urban new stations, as well as upgrades, and work with different types of utilities to maximize the lessons learned so we can apply those lessons in future years. The first year is highlighted on this map in green. We're focusing first on US 97, reflecting guidance from our TINA study to target public investments in rural areas. US 97 is relatively undeveloped now, but is a well-traveled corridor throughout the central part of the state, relatively undeveloped in terms of EV charging infrastructure. The two other areas we looked at are interstates. Interstate 205 is a new all fuel corridor we're proposing this year with the support of the Portland Bureau of Transportation. You can see that insert in the upper left corner. This route goes through many disadvantaged communities along well-traveled urban routes. And Interstate 5 is the most heavily traveled north-south route in Oregon. And while it has many EV charging stations, only a few meet the NEVI minimum standards. Stations from Eugene North to Portland already meet the standards, but south of Eugene is not NEVI ready. The build out of I-5 south of Eugene will create opportunities um, potentially for upgrades to existing charging stations, as well as new investments. 
So these north-south routes are balanced in year two with east-west routes that are shown in yellow. It's principally Interstate 84 with a lot of traffic, large number of disadvantaged communities en route, and a large number of long distance trips, along with Interstate 82, which is up in the upper northeast portion of the state near Hermiston, connecting to Washington, and US 20, which is a major freight route that goes from the coast through Central Oregon to Idaho and beyond. In year three, which is shown in orange, will complete the remaining of today's seven EV alt fuel corridors with Coastal Route 101, East-West Route 26, and Small Urban Interstate, Interstate 405 in Portland, where we hope to invest in an e-mobility hub or a multimodal charging station if we can find extra funds to supplement NEVI. In years four and five, shown in red, um, We'll add US 95 in Southeast Oregon and Oregon 42 in Southwest, along with any new future proposed EV alt fuel corridors. And as we've mentioned before, if funding lasts, we'll also add redundancy, focus on freight corridors, fill in stations along highly trafficked EV routes or meet other goals. Next slide. Implementation. To ensure reliability of the publicly funded chargers, we plan to incentivize achievements of the implementation of the reliability targets over the five-year program and may withhold funds or penalize failure to achieve 97% uptime goals. To ensure that we have robust competitive solicitations, we've already begun conversations with EV charging companies. Oftentimes finding willing site hosts for charging stations can be very difficult, but through our webpage and during our information sessions, we've already heard a great deal of interest from cities and others in becoming site hosts and we'll share this information with the EV charging companies and work with interested parties, incorporating the priorities we develop through the regional workshops. The state plan requires that we address risks, data collection and metrics for evaluating the program and we will be doing so. Next slide. So our new, we are going to achieve or exceed minimum standards. The, as I think Jillian or Jessica mentioned, new federal minimum guidance came out last week as a notice of proposed rulemaking. So it's not finalized yet. And ODOT plans to comment to support or clarify and strengthen federal guidance. Comments are due August 22nd, and it's still uncertain when the minimum standards will be finalized. But Oregon, uh, uh, the Oregon Department of Transportation will meet or exceed these minis, minimum standards and include them all in our contracts. I want to highlight one area where ODOT is offering some flexibility, even as we exceed minimum standards. We are continuing its, our commitment to the quad pod design where feasible, but we're shifting away from that goal being the addition of a firm 350 kilowatt charger at each site to a preference for one charger that's more than 150 kilowatts up to 350 kilowatts. And we'll still seek to future-proof stations for two additional chargers, but again, we'll add flexibility there where appropriate. As Jillian noted earlier, the proposed minimum standards address several aspects of operation. And while we anticipated many of the proposed standards, such as the number of chargers and ports, requirements for open access, interoperability and roaming, civil rights and Americans with Disability Act, um, ODOT will seek to clarify other proposed standards, such as payment mechanisms, data collection, and funding sources for workforce development. Next slide. Uh, on this slide, we wanna just highlight what we're gonna be doing going forward. We'll engage with a full range of stakeholder activities and incorporate specific outreach to voices whom we have not yet heard and who may be hard to reach. And we'll share with you what we hear and how we're taking your concerns into consideration, including evaluations of additional all fuel corridors. All along, we've been committed to hosting regional workshops and communities prior to awarding RFPs to listen and learn each community's EV goals and prioritize desired benefits from the NEVI program. The NEVI program is a constrained program, and so there will be limits to what we can accomplish with NEVI, but we will work with the selected EV charging companies to share the insights that we learn in these regional workshops and engage more closely with communities. This will also be a key strategy for achieving Justice 40 goals. Next slide. Regional workshops will be a valuable tool to fulfill the federal government's suggested approach for achieving and measuring Justice 40 benefits. 
the Justice 40 program requires a minimum of 40% of a broad range of benefits from this funding to flow to disadvantaged communities. The federal government is now encouraging state departments of transportation to engage first with disadvantaged communities in order to identify what benefits matter most to them and then match that to opportunities. The regional workshops we're planning along corridors before awarding an RFP will be designed to do just that, work with communities to identify and prioritize benefits and collaborate on ways to measure achievement of those benefits. Now I'd like to turn over the discussion to Suzanne Carlson, Director of the Climate Office, to talk about next steps. Good morning. Thanks, Mary and everyone. This has been a great presentation with a lot of great information. Um, we will be accepting comments on the concepts that you've heard today through July 6th, and there's uh, contact information here for Matt Noble, who will be uh, herding those comments through. Um, this is a really fast timeline. As you can see, a lot of work to do. We're going to submit our plan on the deadline. Um, by August 1st, 2022, if not before, and then start hosting those regional workshops that Mary discussed. And we'll be doing those in fall and winter. So you can look forward to those upcoming opportunities to engage. We are hoping to hear back from the federal government. Um, their commitment there is that to hear back by September 30th. Um, at the same time, we will also be developing our RFPs for corridor development. So for providers out there, be on the lookout for that. We'll be issuing those in the fall or excuse me, in the winter, uh, anticipating to release those in winter 2022 to 2023. Um, and for those of you who've been engaged and talking to us throughout this process, just know it's it's a lot of work and we're doing our best to juggle it with uh, available resources. So appreciate um, people taking advantage of all the opportunities that we've had to, to engage and help uh, shape the, the plan concepts. And with that, uh, next slide, please, Matt. We'll just show you our website here. Um, we're also posting a lot of information, including webinars here. So that's the best way to probably catch up on information you might've missed. Um, and with that, we're gonna head into uh, question and answers and I'll turn it back to Matt. Thanks. Thanks, Suzanne. So uh, yes, this is the uh, Q&A section now. So if we can have the slides down and all of our panelists uh, bless us with your beautiful faces again to join mine here on screen. And um, so yeah, just a quick little recap. So you'll see that little ribbon in the bottom of your, of your Zoom screen. So you can either uh, raise your hand, which will flag it for me in the uh, meeting attendees. And then I will uh, call on you. I will allow you to unmute yourself and then you will have to unmute yourself. You can ask your question and then uh, you know our lovely panelists will answer you. Also, as many of you have already done, you can just drop your question in the Q&A and then I will try to go through hands first and then also go through the Q&A questions as well. well. We'll bounce back and forth. And if you have technical issues or you get confused, just uh, open the chat bubble. That'll go straight to us uh, as panelists and me so I can help you out with that. So as a demonstration of how this works, uh, Danielle Stewart, I believe you, you've had your hand up for a bit. So I'm gonna unmute you and please ask your question. Now right, you should be able to unmute yourself now, Danielle, if you'd like. Possibly in audio options down in the uh, down in the ribbon there and on, on the uh, bottom menu in Zoom. Matt, can we also ask people to identify what organization or group they're affiliated with? Yes, excellent. Thank you, Mary. Very good point. Let's see. Come on, Zoom. Don't be like this. <laughs> Well, you know what? Let's keep this going. Let's try uh, asking someone else to unmute, and maybe uh, Danielle is having some technical difficulties. So we're going to go with uh, Angus Duncan. I'm going to allow you to talk, and uh, if you could please unmute yourself, that'd be great. Hi, right, this is Angus. Uh, can Can you hear me? I just, that's the first question one asks. Um. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear Good. you. Thanks. Sound great. Need, need an answer. Okay, I dropped this in the Q&A as well. Uh, but one of the, the big challenges, you know, ODOT and everybody in the EV space um, is facing right now is coordination. Um, as, as I note in my question in the Q&A, uh, I count at least six declared a potential sponsors, financers of charging infrastructure, 
you know, technically a lot more than that since one of those, you know, is home charging and another one is private suppliers. Uh, and there are many strategy elements that have to be coordinated among all of these folks so that uh, to the extent possible, we're not, you know, duplicating locations. We are uh, deploying equipment where it's needed. Uh, the equipment you know, can speak to it, can, they can speak to each other and they are relatively easy for a user to use and so on and so forth. So a lot of, of um, strategy elements that go into uh, aligning the work of these different de developers, deployers of uh, charging infrastructure and so far, all I have seen, and it's not just you guys, it's also the utilities and others, every, everybody announces that they are planning to coordinate. Uh, but so far, you know, I have not seen any kind of actual coordination going on or even a strategy for coordinating going on. And uh, in this presentation, ODOT has also declared that it's committed to coordination, but I still don't see what that co coordination involves. It's so that's my question. So um, Angus, uh, let me just describe one or two ways that we are trying to coordinate um, and also just deal with a baseline set of um, foundational information on the NEVI program. So what we're talking about here is specifically those stations that will be NEVI and they will be um, there will be strict federal guidelines to address some of the things that you're talking about in terms of interoperability, communications uh, with one another, whether we can make that, whether we can make them therefore then communicate with all the other stations that are out there is a, a different matter. So um, that would be the ideal, but for sure with the NEVI program, we can make that happen. Secondly, just this past week, we had uh, Portland General Electric present to our zero emission vehicle interagency working group as an example of an effort to try and make sure that we understand where the utilities are proposing to invest in EV charging so that as we develop our plans and as we um, uh, try and target certain areas, we are trying to be complementary and not um, overlapping. Uh, similarly, we have phased some of our corridor development because certain uh, EV charging companies have already stated plans to make charging infrastructure investments that are NEVI compliant along certain routes. So we have phased those routes to be um, updated with NEVI later in the uh, like more, more like year three rather than years one and two so that we can uh, take advantage of additional investments from the private sector. And we will be developing yep. further mechanisms for doing that. So that's kind of what we're working on. Okay. So, so Mary, maybe I'll just add, Angus. I think it's a lot of it's a lot of meetings. So we're having a lot of meetings with a lot of different folks. And I would say um, everybody's kind of recognizing at the same time. There's a lot of people willing to come to the table, work together, plan together, figure out how these things work. Um, and then also, I'll just acknowledge the leadership from the governor herself. Um, and pulling together Western states, trying to get some consistent kind of guidelines um, and requirements to make sure that there's interoperability and some of those kind of things between folks. But um, I would say we're still pretty early in that process overall. Okay, thanks, Amanda, and and thanks, Mary. And and that's certainly good to hear. I just underscore that that location is only one of a lot of different dimensions to coordination. Um, you know, which kinds of machines uh, go where is, you know, is a elaboration on location. Um, if, you, if you're trying to deploy charging infrastructure into lo uh, low income neighborhoods, neighborhoods that have lots of renters, you know, then you're looking at uh, a different kind of siting there. If you're trying to go into an area where there are lots of multifamily uh, uh, residents, multifamily dwellings and few or no uh, uh, parking garages, that's a whole different set. So they, there really need to be technical specs um, and, and uh, best practices specs, I think, that have to be developed. And all of the parties that are going to be participating in this ought to be invited to participate in developing those 
you know, meetings are great, but at some point you got to start putting some things down on paper so that people can sign off on them or not. Um, and, and the, the, my, my point of, of reference here is that. Hey, know, Angus, are, I'm sorry, are, Angus, yeah. I'm, I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but if you would like to follow up with your comments, uh, either to us by email or something else, it's just, we have a couple other hands up and a couple other questions and 20 minutes left. And it's not that we don't appreciate your comments. It's just, I want to make sure we get through people. So if we have time That's in fine. the end, do you want to just go back into the queue and we'll, we'll bring it back up. Okay. Thank you, Angus. I, again, I appreciate, I appreciate uh, you, you work with us here because we want to get through everyone. So to that note, um, let's go with uh, George Sackinger. I'm going to allow you to talk. So if you could please uh, unmute yourself, George, and ask your question. Okay. My question is um, about the emphasis on local charging versus uh, low-income communities such as apartment complexes and the difference between that and highway driving. And I see this as two big different uh, needs, the local charging for like apartment houses. Um, is there a plan out there to implement a building code change where any new or any existing apartments can have uh, low speed J1772 or Chatmo uh, chargers installed by code? And secondly, um, do we need to put those low speed chargers on highways where highways, uh, uh, it's not practical to charge with the low speed chargers? Jillian, do you wanna address this? Do you want me to address it? Mary, apologies, I'm focusing on the questions in the Q&A. So I, okay. why don't you take it? Okay, great. So a couple of things, George. Um, this particular funding opportunity is only for uh, high-speed, fast charging along corridors. So to the extent that we can do the most good that we possibly can by trying to site these in, in areas that are supportive of um, disadvantaged communities and low-income uh, housing developments, you know, within one mile of the freeway exits, but the constraints on the program only allow a certain amount of, of, of effort um, <clears throat> that will be able to be realized. Uh, Jillian is uh, working on developing a level two community EV charging rebate program that should be out by the end of this year. And that will be uh, able to address multi-unit dwelling and other um, stop and shop tourist destination types of charging that uh, both you and Angus were alluding to. There's different types of charging and there will be specs in that um, in that grant program, rebate program um, for uh, charging infrastructure to be involved there. There is a law, I can't remember, Jessica, do you remember the name of the law? Um, if you can, somebody can put it in the chat um, that does require a, a new construction to make um, to provide uh, conduit and wiring for level two charging um, up to I can't remember the exact percentages of the parking spaces. Um, it's a relatively uh, it's it's not as strong a law as we would like to see, um, but there is uh, it does give cities the opportunities to go above and beyond uh, the state levels. So there is kind of progress on all of that. So I think that should address most of your questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, if no one else has a follow-up. Uh, Terrence Hicks, I see you have your hand up. I'm gonna allow you to talk, but I also see you had a question in the chat as well. Uh, so if you'd like to unmute yourself and elaborate on your question or if what's in the chat's okay, uh, let us know. No, um, I always like to get an audience when I get an opportunity and I appreciate that. Um, my name is Terrence Hicks, and I'm actually the Midwest manager for EV Anora, the uh, nation's largest network of diverse, of diverse electric vehicle drivers and enthusiasts. Uh, but more important and germane to this call is uh, we seek e-mobility inclusiveness for diverse populations. So my question, uh, which was also in the chat, from where you stand with the uh, uh, EV uh, funding, what do you see your greatest need uh, as far as diversity, equity, inclusion, and where can a consulting 
arms such as uh, E.B. Noir uh, assist you? So the, I would say there's a really big challenge with the NEVI program um, just per se in that it doesn't address some of the key challenges that I think uh, perhaps uh, underserved, lower income and disadvantaged communities um, address in, in full in terms of location and the type of chargers being invested. In terms of workplace uh, workforce development, in terms of apprenticeship programs, in terms of paying prevailing wages um, and that sort of thing, I think there will be some opportunities there. There are also more opportunities in another portion of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, which we didn't talk about today. It's called Section 11401 uh, funding. There's two and a half billion dollars over five years to go half to community development and half to corridor development. It is a competitive grant program, so it's not a sure thing. And it is uh, covering four different fuels. Um, two of which are electric, hydrogen and um, battery electric. So those are the areas where we are anticipating um, a greater focus on multi-unit dwellings and some of the other locations where we see disadvantaged communities perhaps benefiting, I guess, more um, from than from corridor EV charging. But again, was, we're going to try and do our best. Does, does that help? Yeah, you said section 104, and I missed that last part. I'm sorry, section 11401. Let me just double check it. I'm pretty sure that's the right number. Section 11401, it's called Grants for Charging and Fueling Infrastructure. It's part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that was passed in November. They, um, the uh, federal government has until this coming November to outline the rules and the guidelines for that program. Uh, so unfortunately, there's not much that we can comment on at this point, except we're anticipating that ODOT will spearhead some efforts to try and compete for some of those funds in areas that NEVI doesn't cover, like multi-unit dwellings and inner city charging infrastructure um, and uh, as well as maybe medium and heavy duty vehicles. So those are those are where we see more of those funds and half of those are community oriented and half of them are still on all fuel corridors. Thanks for that. Thank you, Terrence. All right, gonna move on to, uh, looks like we have a question from someone on the phone. So ending in 9819. So I'm gonna allow you to talk 9819 and please uh, unmute and ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, two questions. One, uh, with the $100 million in total, do you have a ballpark figure as to how many charging stations that would represent? Secondly, in terms of maintenance, which has always been a problem, uh, what are the specifications as to how often uh, you expect companies to maintain uh, these uh, stations and check on them to make sure that uh, accessibility is an ongoing is no longer an ongoing problem. So Mary, did you hear all that? I, I think I did. It was a little vague. I think um, two questions. One is for the hundred million dollars, how many new charging stations are we going to get? And the second question is um, uh, uh, how often are we going to uh, will uh, the EV charging companies be required to check up on um, and maintain the charging stations. So um, I'm going to deal with the second one first. So the in terms of the, the there is still guidance coming out from the federal government that's going to uh, require um, certain levels of reliability and reporting on that reliability metrics. Um, over time, but in general, we expect to have uh, at minimum, um, well, put it this way, uh, the, the, the requirements are going to include that the charging companies either themselves maintain or have an operating, uh, have, a, have a contract, a maintenance contract with someone. And the, the general requirements are typically that you're supposed to 
uh, address problems within 48 hours. The network, these will all be network chargers and they should have a remote capability for uh, both individuals to note where there's charging um, problems, but the chargers themselves should also be providing data that should indicate when they are not operating. So um, with the exception of, you know, if it's a power outage or something like that, that's completely out of their control, you know, the goal right now that's in the federal guidelines is within 48 hours. So there should be ongoing maintenance and uh, review all the time from these chargers um, that's happening, happening electronically, but there will also be opportunities for individuals to note and share that information. And in terms of, you know, I don't have a really good number um, I know, uh, for, for how far we're gonna get with all the charging in part because the $100 million, uh, not all of that is completely figured out, but also because it's a, a mix of level two charging that's publicly available as well as um, the DC fast charging. With the NEVI program itself, we do feel like we're gonna at least double at a minimum we're going to double the number of chargers right now, uh, charging stations right now, charging ports, I'm sorry, double the number of charging ports right now uh, from about 260 something or other to 525 something or other at a minimum. And that we expect to um, also uh, increase by at least a third the number of charging ports, uh, charging stations that are gonna be there. I'm sorry. Jessica, you wanna correct? Just 260 ports um, that are non-Tesla. Uh, I think that's really important to note. Uh, so looking at a third more of uh, uh, 260 is about 70, 75, somewhere in that range. So um, uh, I think that's a good enough math for at this point and stage in the game. Okay, well, thank you for your question. Appreciate that. And uh, we're gonna answer one from the chat now. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you're good. Okay, cool. And that's one from the chat now. Um, so this is from Charlie in the chat, guys. Medium and heavy duty freight corridors were noted as a year three activity in your presentation. Planning for medium heavy duty charging is a long lead time activity and should start in year one. Does ODOT plan to include a funding request for medium heavy duty freight corridor planning in the August one plan submittal? So this this particular program, the NEVI program, is principally a light duty vehicle program. It's specified pretty clearly in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and in the guidance that we've received. Um, we are interested in being supportive of medium and heavy duty uh, charging infrastructure and anticipate that when we um, are have uh, more insight into the section 11401 grants that we will be pursuing standalone medium and heavy duty charging infrastructure through that um, through those competitive grants in terms of uh, the actual nevi stations we are hoping and trying to address medium and heavy duty actually it's more medium duty concerns uh, by both having really high powered chargers having as many stations as we can with 350 kilowatt chargers, or certainly those that are faster than 150 kilowatt chargers, and also through station design, um, where we will be uh, trying to encourage as many as practical pull-through stations so that we will be um, able to charge uh, vans, delivery vans, and uh, uh, pickup trucks with trailers and that sort of thing uh, at our uh, fast charging stations. So. Um, but we indicate freight corridors in our plan only in that uh, the federal government is going to announce some sort of uh, designation of alternative fuel freight corridors, but they have not set aside any specific funding for that at this point, other than the Section 11401 competitive grants. Amanda, do you want to add on to that? You're muted, Amanda. Sorry, thank you, I was double muted, appreciate it. Uh, so we talked about the uh, investment of at least 100 million towards EV charging infrastructure. Um, and that is because there is 2.5 billion available from the federal government in discretionary grants. And I think that's really where 
we're going to go pretty heavily on the freight side, um, looking for how we develop out that infrastructure. So I'll just note that beyond NEVI, there are other funding sources. Yes, we will look at those. Yes, it will be sooner than four or five years from now. It's going to be pretty quick that we're going to look at those things too. All right, thank you, Amanda. All right, we have about four minutes left, and I do want to get to two questions about uh, the charging stations themselves and some of the requirements for site house. However, Jessica, did you have anything you wanted to follow up with the versus level two in um, DC fast charging? A comment? Yeah, I just wanted to reflect that there there is definitely a need to understand where level two and DC fast charging both play a role in these things. And so the focus of this plan is on DC fast charging right now. And just to be clear that there are many opportunities for level two charging that will support some of the things that were identified here as well. Um, but that is in a separate process of what's going on and, and a point to look at the transportation electrification infrastructure needs analysis that ODOT did, which has a lot of that information in there. So. Um, I don't want people to think that we're excluding certain things. There's just a focus of what this plan has to work on versus what the state is working on as a whole. Thanks, Jessica. And as I referenced a little bit ago, so I want to ask you guys uh, com sort of combine two questions here that we had early on in the presentation. Uh, what measures are being taken to ensure safety at charging stations? Or I guess in another way, has there been any guidance about that or do we have plans for that? And related to that, are there any requirements for host sites like restrooms, food and drink, stuff like that? Have there, is there anything in the requirements? Do we have plans? So um, safety is critically important and we will have um, safety standards that will be included in our requirements for site hosts. Um, similar to those that we have right now in the West Coast Electric Highway. We have that both in our request for proposal and also through the branding requirements. There are a, a variety of safety ingress and egress and um, those uh, safety features that are affiliated with Americans with Disability Act. There is or um, there is likely to be from the federal government, some suggestions for lighting as well for safety purposes. And there is encouragement for uh, stations to be cited in proximity to or near proximity to various amenities such as restrooms and drinking water and um, places to eat and that sort of thing. Um, the only absolute requirement the federal government has stated, not only, but one of the absolute requirements that they have stated is that stations need to be operational 24-7. Um, but um, we expect when these federal government minimum guidelines are finally issued um, after the notice of propo proposed rulemaking uh, process, that there will be incremental additional requirements having to do with safety and lighting and um, ingress and egress and other aspects. But we have already got experience undertaking those types of requests and requirements through our West Coast Electric Highway uh, program. Thank you, Mary. And it is 11.59. So uh, panelists, do you want to follow up with anything or any other uh, comments that you wanted to make, things we didn't get to, mm -hmm. parting thoughts, a poem perhaps, anything you got, anything you, you guys want to add before we wrap up today? I'll, I'll just remind everybody that any questions that we didn't get to, we're, we're going to be releasing uh, an FAQ after this webinar and we'll be sure to post it uh, to our website. And I'll just remind people that if you have further comments uh, or questions, um, but especially if you have specific comments about what we presented here, uh, please direct those to Matt Noble. Um, Matt, do you have, is your email in the chat as well? Just put it in um, there. Just put great, it in there. Great, great. Um, so by July 6th, that's the date by which uh, close of business July 6th is the date when we would like to have uh, those comments so that we can take them into consideration. Great, thank you. Anyone, anyone else? Are we panelists good? And uh, John, I saw your request for a poem. I will type a haiku. I type a haiku just to you in the chat in a minute here, and um, I'm going to do it. And uh, so, yes, I think let's wrap up the webinar for the day. So, like uh, Mary said or Jillian said, we will have all your questions. I have 
all the information in front of me that I'll be recorded. We have all of your uh, email addresses for the attendees today. So I will also be sending up a follow-up email with the uh, presentation, the answers to the questions, the FAQ, and um, and we'll be uploading this recorded presentation to the ODOT YouTube later this week. So that'll all be in a nice little package. And then Mary, I saw you, I saw you signal me. Anything else? Yeah, I just want to encourage any of you who are on um, that have uh, not gone to our website yet, please go to our website, please take our surveys, please help us uh, by sharing where you would like to see uh, charging stations located on our interactive map. So I would really appreciate that. And you can find lots of other good information, including the last webinar and all the FAQs in response to the last webinar. So thank you so much for your um, interest and we um, value your input. Thank you, Mary. Well said. All right. Well, that concludes today's webinar. Hope you guys learned something. Hope this was a, a positive experience. And like you said, questions, comments, direct them to me. And uh, yeah, have a great day, everybody. Thank you.